Good morning, everybody. Paul Rossi here, founder and COO of 910 Drones. This is the uh, third webinar that we're doing in partnership with NCDPI. And we had some, not only did we have technical difficulties right before um, starting this webinar uh, in regards to screen sharing and things like that, but we also had technical difficulties in the fact that I forgot to hit the record button um, at the beginning of our session. So we went through and did a live demonstration. We had a couple of the um, panelists introduce themselves and I had not recorded any of that. So I'm re-recording this beginning in order to tie it in um, to the uh, completion of the webinar itself. So with that being said, um, thank you for joining us. This webinar today is about um, integrating drones with mapping and modeling. We're gonna be talking about the planning, execution, and um, processing and an analysis side of uh, 3D mapping and modeling. We have three great guests that are joining us today. We have Gulrez Khalid with uh, Skybrows, and Skybrows is helping, uh, they're helping public safety agencies um, better uh, leverage UAS drones as a tool for crash reconstruction and then just for situational awareness. Also joining us is uh, Narcisa Prykope, and she's with uh, UNC Wilmington. Um, she's done drone education there, uh, worked with students, and she's flown all over um, the globe for data collection in the environmental sciences space. Um, so great to have her joining us. And then our third and final guest is gonna be Kyle Snyder uh, with Clancy and Thays. He's their VDC coordinator. Uh, he's leveraging drones to do some uh, amazing things to track the progress um, of construction and, and help keep things on schedule. So those are our three panelists. Um, I, I apologize to them for having uh, not recorded their introductions. I would have loved to have them introduce themselves to you, um, but that, that just didn't happen. So after this live demonstration, you will see that we're jumping right into conversation um, with these folks talking about the three things that I mentioned, planning, execution, um, and analysis. So now at this time, I'm just gonna kick it over to do that demonstration. All right, everybody. Now I am outside here at our uh, flight uh, training center here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. You can see we have our uh, Mavic 2 Pro set up in the, the far distance. We have a vehicle that we're simulating and uh, came off the road in some sort of accident um, during the day. We have uh, a tree over here on our side and we've got some power lines. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to leverage uh, Skybrows. We're going to go ahead and, and show you how we, we can fly and map this area. So this is a software that works with DJI drones. We've got some information here that shows us, you know, the steps that we need to take. Very simple, um, not uh, difficult. So you can see we have the drone screen shows up. Again, there's the Mavic. Here's what the Mavic is seeing. We have like our DJI apps, ready to go GPS. We're seeing our satellites. We're getting all that same information. So we're gonna do a takeoff with a tap of a button. And now the drone is just, taking off and what we want to do now is we're going to do a quick check of our system so we're going to fly forward we're going to fly backward left right and we're going to yaw and I'm going to show you the drone if you can see it and we're yawing left and yawing right and what we're doing is we're making sure that all of our uh, directional commands are, are lining up and our drones good to go so at this point now I'm just taking the Mavic 2 and I'm going to fly it directly over our subject or the center point of the area that we want mapped. And what that's going to be is, is my vehicle that's located just out there. And now we're flying directly again over what we would call our point of uh, interest. And then we're going to climb to an altitude of 40 feet. And we'll climb it out to about 40 five feet based on the surrounding um, obstacles. We always want to pick an altitude that's going to allow us to stay clear of obstacles. So we're over the center. We've got our altitude. We're going to hit fly sky brows. And for more detail, we're going to do large. So if you can see this here, we're going to hit large. 
Do we want one or two circles? Again, for more detail, we're gonna hit two. And we're gonna show you how even, um, even with the settings of large and two circles, we're still going to get this mission flown in a very short amount of time. So now you're gonna hear that beep. The drone is now recording video and it's circling with a, the software to pick up the video that we're gonna to use to create our 3D model and map. So without any touching of the sticks, what we're doing right now in any time we're mapping or modeling with any software as the operator, as the remote piloting command, we are watching our telemetry. We are watching our height, we're watching the distance, we're checking our GPS, we are making sure we're watching our battery to ensure that we have enough battery to continue and fly our mission. The drone at this point is now going for the second circle. It raised its altitude and it moved a little bit further away in order to bring in more detail. Again, this is all happening on its own. And as I was mentioning, we're watching that telemetry. So students that are flying, they're watching and they're seeing that the drone is behaving the way it's supposed to. The video is being captured and they're prepared to take control should something occur. You know, say uh, a manned aircraft comes by or there's other drones nearby. What you're going to do is you're going to take control of that aircraft using the software itself. So now you can see that this has finished its flight. I'm going to turn it towards us and I'm going to bring it back home. Oh, turn too much. And just like that, in a minute and 30 seconds, the drone has collected what it needed. So from piloting, you are piloting and doing manual and auto capture when leveraging this software because you have to get it to where you want it to go. So you're just using the typical stick skills that we learn as a pilot and then leveraging software to get the mission completed. That right there is a live demonstration example of SkyBrowse. We're going to move inside and you're going to see more about how we uh, put this up and what we can do with maps and models. All right, so we're back inside. You just saw us capture the video using the Mavic 2 Pro. We've got the SD card that we are inputting into the computer. So we just went through planning and execution from the public safety side and how we're doing this quickly and efficiently in order to clear roads not doing repetitive missions in the same area. So I'm gonna bring up that screen share. And what you can see is our most recent flight right here um, is showing as it needs the video uploaded. So we're gonna just click upload video. We're gonna to navigate to our SD card, which is inserted into the computer. And we're gonna pull this recent flight. And now that video is gonna upload, you can see down here in the lower right corner, depending on your internet speed is what's going to impact how fast this uploads. So the, this has nothing to do with the processing. It's just how quickly is your internet to get the video to where to the point of where it will begin processing. Similar to the other uh, platforms out there, drone deploy picks 4d you upload those pictures too. And I'm just getting ahead of myself because I'm having to redo this, but we have to upload the pictures and it's dependent upon your um, individual computer. Uh, internet speed, whereas once we start talk about processing the models, that's the speed of the actual software itself. And that's where SkyBrowse stands apart and you can process things extremely quickly. So that's the upload portion um, of SkyBrowse. What I want to do now is we've come to the point where I'm going to stop this screen share, um, where I kind of picked up and, and, and remember to hit the recording. So we're gonna have a transition right here and we're gonna start jumping into this conversation. Again, thank you everyone for joining us and apologies
for those technical glitches. So now I'm going to bring on uh, all three of our panelists. Cool. Yeah. I can do that too, I think. Audie, get that muted. All right, awesome. Perfect. Yeah. So um, now that we've got you know the introductions out of the way, I want to just jump into these these three areas of mapping from planning to the execution um, of that mission uh, flight, and then into kind of the processing and and what is it that is created from this whole workflow. Um, so I want to start with you, uh, Narcisa, if you could kind of talk a little bit about um, planning, right? Okay. What goes into um, planning in order to create a successful um, mission? Can you see my screen? No. Okay, right. That's not, I had to share screen. Um, let's try that again. How about now? Yes. And if I go to full screen, then I don't know if I see you still. Okay, like this, you guys see it? Perfect. Yeah, so I had a couple of notes. I've been flying drones for over four years now since I got my first thing fixed wing. And obviously the number, the number one step to take care of is to get part 107, part 107 certified. And that once, once that happens, I'm not necessarily gonna go into details on how that happens, but uh, once that's, taken care of, you, or at least once you have a um, remote piloting command on your team, then you can start worrying about some other things. And one of the first things we always worry about when we start mission, uh, planning a mission is, um, first of all, do I have permission to fly there? Am I, am I surveying? Am I flying in an area that's restricted or controlled or that I might encounter um, towers or any kind of of, of issues, uh, and what I really, one of the best ways to check that is to use this Sky Vector Aeron Aeronautical Charts app. It's awesome. And then right before you go flying, the day before, it's really useful if you use this before you fly mobile app to check and see if there are any re restrictions in your area or anything that you should, um, it, whether you're in proximity to an airport or airfield or air pad or anything like that. So that's number one sort of rule of thumb. Then some of the other things we always think about is what kind of drone am I flying? If I'm flying a fixed wing, one of those that looks like an airplane, then we have to think about different or we have to have different considerations than we're, if we're flying say a, a Phantom, a DJI Phantom or a Matri or, or a Mavic or something like that. So we always want to think about what kind of obstacles might we come across, right? Am I going to be able to have enough room to take off and land? Or um, am I experienced enough with takeoff and landings? Do I have enough room to see what I want to see and so on and so forth? And then the other really big thing we think about it when we plan a mission is how high am I going to need to fly? What kind of a plan do I need to make to make sure that I get data that I can see on the ground whatever it is that I want to see? So if I want to fly to inspect uh, power lines or if I'm flying just to make a map of a, a residential area or something, then I want to fly at different elevations to capture a different sort of size on the ground. Um, normally, we, we refer to this as overlap, so essentially the overlap between um, the photographs and usually a, a fixed on an an aircraft of any kind will fly along a path, right? So it goes along a flight path that we can predetermine. I'm assuming that this is, you have to get 3D products, you have to have a predetermined mission. So you have to have a flight path. And along the flight path, um, you're gonna be needing to take some of the photos with a certain amount of um, forward or inside overlap. And with that information, and there are different ways Again, depending on the desired product at the end and the desired spatial resolution, I'm showing here an example of such a mission plan in a, in a program called Emotion. Um, and here you basically just, just make a polygon that you want to map, you select an elevation, and then you select that um, frontal and side overlap in such a way as to get the desired resolution at the end. So if you want to get 2.8 centimeters per pixel, then you have to fly at, say, um, 119 meters. So that's about 400 feet with this kind of an overlap. So just as an example, right? So, or, and here's kind of another view of a similar setup, but maybe with a different camera. Now, yeah. if you're flying a, 
um, just a quadcopter, so a DJI Mavic or a DJI Phantom, and you want to get 3D products, then- And, and, and Nar Narcisa, if you don't mind, um, yes. right kind of at this point, because what I like is you're showing that emotion software with the fixed wing platform, and mm -hmm. the ability to understand, you touched on overlap. So mm -hmm. grammatry as a science from like educators working with students, understanding what the software is actually doing and mm -hmm. understanding different overlap because you go in there, you know, as a mission planner pilot, you just change your altitude and the overlap kind of does its own thing. Um, but there's a, there's a point where you need to know what overlap do I need for this operation? And yes. understanding why overlap, that's something that, that I think instructors can really touch on instead of just whipping right through the software. It's like explaining that science behind it. And I, and I think what you were about to jump into is some quadcopter stuff. And what I want to do is go to Kyle Snyder, um, who I think is working specifically with the quadcopters um, and could probably start touching on what you were going to maybe get into is like either okay. me or drone deploy. Um, Kyle. But, uh, yeah, go yeah, ahead. But <laughs> quickly, to your point of yes. explaining the overlap, I was hoping to kind of get to that. So the idea here, exactly what you said, the photogrammetry is the, the basic principle is if we do not have these photographs basically overlapping enough, then we can't um, extract enough sort of known locations, <laughs> photographs, so that when we do the photogrammetric processing we can actually identify objects and tie them together and i'm going to talk about that when i talk about the processing excellent thank you narcisa and kyle if you uh want to tell us a little bit about like planning from your on um, the construction side of things if it's similar or different and then what you're using maybe yeah sure so um let me see if i could share this up over here so um, from planning side, I mean, similar with what we were kind of just touching on before, you know, making sure you have the airspace cleared. And then from my perspective, and Nar I'm really trying Narcisa, to... is this your screen share? It, I believe so. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, so. well, I don't, I was going to say, if you don't mind taking it down or if Kyle, if you need to put anything up. Okay. okay. I think, yeah, Let's I was see. just going yeah, either way. I <laughs> yeah, you're fine. So I think, um, I mean, what I'm using is, um, so 3DR site scan recently, recently got purchased by Esri, but they essentially use Pix4D's like behind the scenes, you know, processing, um, uh, whatever their processing engine. So essentially we're doing this, the same thing here. Um, and for what I'm looking to do, um, a lot of like what I start looking at when I'm doing my scanning is making sure I'm getting all the various faces of the buildings and things I want to look at. So not only am I doing like one crosshatch, but maybe I'll add a perimeter scan around a building or I'll go in and take manual photos myself and then upload those to the actual scan itself. Um, and then much like, let's see if I have this in here. You know, much like we just talked about before, the nice thing about these programs is they all do this for you behind the scenes. Um, I think I'm probably lagging a little bit here, but you know, no, you just say, yeah, and I would say, well, from a planning, like you can repeat, you can do repetitive if you're, oh, you're looking yeah. at right from that construction standpoint where you, uh, maybe you can touch on that where, and, and not that other folks aren't doing the same repetitive missions, especially in that remote sensing field, right, Narcisa. Um, but maybe you could touch on Kyle, just that from, from the planning, what goes into it, uh, uh, Maybe I'm. Oh, no, you're God. good. I can, I can, yeah. I can take that and go with it. Um, <laughs> so I mean, this end screen here. The nice thing about these platforms is I basically create a flight plan, and then that gets uploaded, you know, to that quadcopter via. I'm using an iPad here. But the nice thing about it is it's saved in the system. So once you fly it once and you know that how you dial it in, it's dialed in correctly. I go back out there and I can refly a previous mission or a flight plan that's saved there. So I can do that. I can also set it up myself and have another pilot go out and fly it. Like I can set the flight plan for them. And really once you get something that you like, you can just consistently, you know, do it over and over with, um, you know, sort of like re reliability. You're not trying to figure it out every time on the fly. 
Yeah, that, that's great. And I think that's what we're seeing with the mapping modeling is progression, whether it's construction progression, remote sensing, seeing change. Um, one thing that I had considered doing was like going out flying because we have the, the hurricanes and disasters. And it's like just seeing, especially with like the Fayetteville State University, trying to figure out how these mm -hmm. students can get involved with some sort of project because you don't always know what's going to change. And that's the reason why you're out there collecting data. Um, Gores, you uh, fallen asleep over there. I'll bring you back in. Can you tell us a little bit about planning uh, in regards to SkyBrows and um, right? And so public or public safety and right. So as I spoke before, uh, we're primarily focused on uh, public safety and within public safety, first responders. So um, the planning phase is quite different for those guys versus construction or telcos or you know linear infrastructure and so on uh, primarily because they're always in a hurry they 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 they're not they, they don't get the chance to plan a mission as such if there's a car accident they're more occupied with uh, clearing the road versus being able to sit down and figuring out how to capture the the model and that is, that is the reason why we are trying to simplify the whole process with, with 3D modeling for those guys. So essentially, if using videography, the planning is just about making sure that you have the license, you're authorized to, to find that area, which those guys always are, and you don't have any obstacles in the area. And that's pretty much it. And that is just now, and before it was very different, which is why, uh, what we've heard from a lot of public safety departments, and I was just speaking to uh, Captain here in Peel in, in Canada, and those guys have multiple softwares available for years, and uh, they just don't get the chance to use it because there's so much pressure to deal with the scene that and if somebody plans the mission, by the time they can fly it, the situation has changed altogether. Yeah, so, in time. So it's a public safety exactly. matter of time, and then it's a tool. We see it as a tool in each um, environmental sciences and construction. It's a tool, though, that police officers and firemen, they don't get to use as often. Um, and they're not as familiar uh, with some of this stuff. So yeah. that's, that's, uh, that's definitely a, a huge positive. Um, and, yeah. it's not, and it's not the solution like for all you, because sometimes you've got to get into this heavy, detailed, um, you know, oh, time over change. When you want to talk about absolute and relative accuracy, sometimes you have to tie in different things, um, which I know Nar Narcisa is super familiar with. Um, so, right, but for with, most scenarios, yeah. again, absolute accuracy is not 100% needed. If you if you have a centimeter level accuracy, even that that flies as long yeah. as you're, you're maintaining chain of custody for the evidence and and that kind of stuff, then yeah. relative accuracy. Uh, which uh, so far SkyBrowse is actually giving around less than a centimeter accuracy on all objects and points yeah. of contact. So, well, with that, um, let's kind of move into the execution. Um, and maybe Kyle, I will start with you here. Um, you know, executing that mission that you planned. What is it? What does it look like? Um, and 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 also. It might be like, touch on how some of these flights are automated, but you also mentioned manual capture. Um, so what does that look like at Calancy and Thays, going out and executing a mission? Right. So some of it depends on what sites we're going out and capturing. So a lot of times if we're doing like, a, I don't know, some sort of site analysis where it's just an open site, that would probably be a lot more automated where some of the sites when we're in construction, there's a lot of people on site. So it's going to be tough to, you know, you get into that gray area of flying over non-participants and I've heard different people argue different things, but sometimes with an active job site with tower cranes swinging various people, I'll more manually fly a specific area. So I can, I think I'm a little safer that way. Um, and then there's some areas where, like I was mentioning before, you want to get the side of the building, it's going to be tough to really automate that sometimes where if I just get in there manually and fly it, um, I can do it that way. And then the last part would be more so like progress photos, marketing photos. Sometimes it's a lot better to fly it manually because you can actually see it on your screen 
you know, when you fly, so you can really line up the shot how you want more like artistically than if you're just trying to automate, you know, like waypoints or something like that. And, uh, and it's all data. It's just whether it's captured automatically or manually, mm -hmm. pictures are pictures and they have the same information. So uh, when you go out, would you say uh, kind of like single operator? Do you try to pull a VO when you can? Um, do you yeah, but most of the time it's myself. Um, I will pull someone on the site if I need some help, but you know, we we're kind of lean and we're, we're, you know, it's tough to get people, but obviously you want to be safe at the same time. So if it's a certain mission where I need it, I can always, the good, nice thing is most job sites, there's always someone on site I could pull if I need it. You, I don't need yeah. to drag them with me. And you're familiar with your sites. You're operating on the same mm -hmm. locations, um, routinely. So you're kind of the person that is, uh, really aware of the site itself because you're looking right. at it, you're looking at it from a, a, a view that most of the, the folks aren't especially guys on the ground uh, now narcisa from an execution standpoint because i've seen some of the slides and then i think you could definitely um share some of that from that execution or maybe i'm pulling you off guard because of, of the edit there no no this i apologize this for is that. fine um no I would say, I would say just to follow up on what Kyle said, um, from my perspective, I go to sites that are necessarily unknown. And sometimes I go to completely new sites where I have to do, I have to have a big, they don't have a sorry guys. It's all right, it's all right. We're all living it. Um, Gures, for, yeah. um, and you can touch on this quick, from an execution, we've seen it, we just made the video. We, um, the pub, Public safety, like with this soft, with this uh, ability, tell us. Shut up. Ex 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 execution for public safety is primarily just what you did, uh, Paul, in the beginning of this of this uh, webinar. You take the drone. You're always in a hurry. You want to clear out the scene. So now this is what public safety is moving to. You just fly it and grab a quick moment. A minute. A minute and thirty. A minute. Yeah, a minute and thirty seconds. If you're if you're covering, let's say, two hundred and fifty thousand square kilometers. I'll, I'll, I'll show a model related to that. You cover that in, in nine minutes and uh, you just, it's all, you know, you, you, if you get the chance to draw custom flight paths, if it's like a really large model or, you know, play around a little bit, but if you're just map, mapping the scene, it's pretty much just press a button, small, large, and that's it. That's, that's just the execution. Yeah. And uh, we'll bounce back to Narchisa here. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> she right. came in right no at the worries. wrong time. But I was gonna add, I always bring at least two or three hands in the field because we have to get all that ground control points. So we spend a lot of time thinking about placement of those ground control points and deploying somebody, somebody, a team that actually takes control of these ground control points while the drone, well, we place them before the drone flies, but then we have to go back and collect them. So, so there's that the very important piece to mission execution that we kind of have to deal with every so time. In order to get data that we can derive 3D products from, with actual, with, with the ability to say how accurate how accurate that data is relative to checkpoints on the ground. Right. So from an execute, we're talking execution. Execution. And, and that is a part of executing. That a, is a mission for you, and you with the ground control points. It's a critical part. Yes. Of, Tell us. Of, I want you to just touch on absolute versus relative Can you do that just to put it into perspective sure, yeah so essentially we if if we didn't implement ground control points on the ground then the products the 3d products or the mapping products that we derive from drone you can consider them relative relative to how to your gps locations that your telemetry as the drone was flying however if you bring and you lay down these ground control points which you can make them from cardboard you, they can be pretty low tech as long as they are laid out before you fly um, and they are surveyed with a relatively high accuracy gps then we can actually get absolute locations that are absolute basically that are um a reference to real world, co world coordinates but in absolute terms Great. So it's like we can talk about an accuracy of usually we get accuracies of two centimeters, right? Two to five, depending on how the day went and whether I'm flying uh, a mission for for sort of 
to, to get mapping products or I'm doing LIDAR collection because I also collect um, drone data using a LIDAR platform, which gives us a, basically a real, a, 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 um, a direct observation of different elevations. So a, a very, very dense cloud point. Great. And I would say, so, at, and, and to kind of bring that in, absolute is exactly where it is on the Exactly. Board. Exactly where at this it is point. relative to real world to to your real world, relative to whatever you're referencing it to. But if you just don't do the ground control points, you still get really good data. But it's relative to to a, the, to the map itself, to the model yes, itself. So you have itself. internal. So you'll have that internal accuracy. So yes. say, um, yeah. from like can that, I, go ahead, go yeah, ahead, Kyle. Can I add on that? So, I mean, we ran into that in our job sites where you're, that comes in where you're reflying it multiple times. Because if you're using the relative, it's not going to line up from one flight to the next. So, one thing that we've been doing is we've actually just been spray painting targets on manholes in the adjacent streets. And then we'll have our surveyors go out and survey those coordinates. Mm -hmm. And that becomes the ground control that we just use, you know, flight after flight on some of our sites. Because for you, it's overlays, right? You're taking work and you're wanting to overlay. And even for Narcisa, when you're talking about changes over time, you can overlay and see what's changed. So you've got to make sure when you're putting exactly. those two together that, that they aren't off by three, five, 10, 15 feet. And that, exactly. they, that not only is the accuracy correct, but then that the images sit right on top of each other. So, um, mm -hmm. And then for us, like we're managing grading and elevation. So you want to get the specific, like I can in the model pick it and it'll give me the exact elevation it's at. So I can compare it to, you know, finished floor or a foundation elevation where yeah. relative you're always guessing how accurate it is. Great. Okay. And I want to, now we kind of made this nice transition into the, the processing um, part of it, the data you know, the pulling information from those images that we've collected. Uh, the, is this, so when, and I want to touch on public safety, right? Cause, cause we're talking about the accuracy internal and we're going to see this in when we move on to these showing models within that public safety and within some uh, environments, internal accuracy was, like if you're surveying a car accident a crash scene you want to be able to know how far off of the curb was this tire and it doesn't matter where that tire might be right Gorez if you want to touch right. on right yeah yeah so basically what you're looking at is you you're looking at the the accuracy of things relative to other things within the model and and that's the that's the idea. So you if you if you've got a car contact, and uh, you've got some debris, sometimes you want to match how far that debris is from the car just to estimate how hard the car the car hit uh, you know that point of contact. And uh, so so the measurement is from that debris to the car, or from the other car to this car, or from the curb to the. So it's always what in most scenarios. What you always need is accuracy within the model itself. So from that point of view, uh, of course, a relative accuracy may not fulfill the requirements of other scenarios. But in this scenario, the, the problem is the problem that the public safety guys have been facing throughout has been time and simplicity and, and not a problem with, with accuracy. Because that's something they can, they can deal with as long as it's, it's a centimeter or two. Right. And it's, it's relative, right? So, yeah. Awesome. So then, Narcisa, if you can kind of take us into this processing um, and show us some of the projects, maybe, if you have any um, examples uh, or, or photos um, that just you can speak to. Uh, and you're on, if you can unmute yourself, Narcisa. <laughs> Okay. All yeah. right. Really brief, and I'll speak to um, just very again, very briefly. I collect data with uh, just RGB, so electro optical, multispectral for vegetation types of applications or agricultural. 
thermal data for different applications that have to do with runoff or pollution in streams, and then um, LIDAR. And essentially for processing purposes, you can use a variety of different softwares. They all bring different things to the table and you have to have a lot, you have to make a lot of considerations uh, in terms of that go back to your mission planning and your mostly the mission planning, but um, in, in thinking about how you're gonna process your data to get the desired products, you know, you're gonna have different processing times and different computer requirements, whether you're, you're, you're processing RGB data, multispectral data, thermal data, on the right, that's an example of, of products from uh, Mason Borough Island. But usually, I'll, I'll run you through maybe a two minute, if I can do it. How do you take those photographs? Because what the drone essentially does is it has a GPS and it takes a bunch of photos. Now, let's imagine we're just doing RGB imagery, right? Then yeah. what you do with that, those are just photographs that essentially have a timestamp and they have, they have some information about, that. a lot of information actually, appended to each photo and then we bring that photo in say uh, and i'll talk about how you do it in pix4d because pix4d standard and it underlies a lot of other software packages and it's really nice but again depending on what kind of imagery you've collected whether it was rgb multispectral thermal you can get different things out of it, basically so what i wanted to do is go through a very very quick i'm not going to go over what all of these things are but just to say that in the photograph in sort of photogrammatic grammatic how you put stuff together, how you put these photographs together um, is really important. There are some key parameters and maybe just I'll go over some of the, the really basics on, of how do the photographs get put together to get those final products, those nice 3D maps. So the, the big critical piece is key points. So as the drone is traveling along its flight path, it's taking photographs from, it, it kind of yaws and pitches and it movements, right? So it's going to take photographs that are slightly off balance. So essentially what, this, what any software mostly does is it finds these things that we call key points and they can just appear in photographs, smaller, larger, rotated sideways. So it finds those and then most softwares will implement a fancy algorithm that has been around for a while that essentially all it does is it's able to recognize the same kind of things irrespective of how an image is moved around and, and basically illuminated and so on. And then what it does is it matches those key points between sort of between those overlapping images. Remember how we talked about side and, and frontal overlap, but this is the point right here. This is why things have to overlap so that when the software identifies these key points in different many images, then they get put together um, and essentially you can start from each of those key points. What you see here on the right, top right, is what we call um, a very sparsely or sparse point cloud. So all of those key points get extracted to, to little clouds of data and then those clouds of data become densified in the pro with the additional image. So you can start kind of getting, getting a sense for what's, what's happening there on the ground. And then as, as, as we proceed, then all of these um, key points, they get stitched together into what we call a three-dimensional mesh, right? So that starts giving you an idea of what things look like from all different angles. And then we can start generating our 3D products. So one of the most important 3D products that we can get from drones, and this is why drones are so powerful, is because they give us this third dimension that we don't really get from satellite imagery unless you do fancy things with that satellite imagery. But we can essentially model all the objects that are on the Earth surface, right, and create what we call a digital surface model. Um, we can actually, depending on what kind of drone we're flying, we can, uh, um, we can also derive um, a digital terrain model. So we can look and see what's, what does the ground look like with very high resolution if you remove all those objects, right? Um, and then finally, the other nice product that, that we can get from drones is what we call an orthomosaic, where you do take the, that, that surface and you colorize it essentially to get an image like that that basically gives you it gives you, you know, have topography and vegetation and dunes and, and also um, nicely, colorfully, visually pleasingly colored. And that's it. Awesome. That's awesome. All those different uh, from just from pictures, right? And as you said, some, some of the different final uh, outputs that you get depend on if you have some thermal or um, yes. some folks talked about, I think uh, the 
the last two webinars we had for the, the DPI Wednesday, Thursday, we talked about uh, uh, NDVI sensors, thermal sensors. Exactly, multispectral, so, yes. Multispectral, so the ability to capture images and then we get all these exports uh, um, that tell us different pieces of information. So, mm -hmm. um, Kyle, could you uh, touch on, um, you know, how are you uh, leveraging some of these outputs in order to create, you know, information, right? Taking this, taking this raw data, like Narcisa walked through, it's taking that raw drone data and it's creating these, um, mm -hmm. these uh, products. And then how are they kind of leveraged? Yeah, sure. So pull this one over. So, I mean, going back on that, there's, you know, kind of those three file types that we were looking at previously is, um, you know, like that 2D image. And then from my point of view, we're getting like a 3D point cloud and a 3D mesh file. So the 2D image, I mean, that's getting a lot of just people like it to get like an overall view of the job site, marking it up. Maybe they're going to draw some logistics stuff on there, you know, putting some comments on there. And then the 3D point cloud, that's where we're actually getting into um, overlaying that with some of our 3D um, BIM modeling data that we're, because the other thing I'm doing is we're doing some virtual coordination of the building itself. So now we're able to kind of overlay this virtual space with the reality capture that we're getting of our job sites. So those are kind of like the two different areas where I'm using those different file types for different purposes. So it's just the beginning. When you get when you get the uh, the the uh, software drone deployer picks for you that you're leveraging, when that kicks out that um, that final product, that's really for you the beginning of now taking that into that overall workflow that's been in, in existence before drones existed, right? Um, a little bit. There are some things that we're doing with drones that we couldn't do previously. So I mean, this is. So I'll kind of start from the beginning. So this is one thing we're doing is really evaluating the existing conditions of a site. Um, so I'll probably catch up, but this is a project downtown Raleigh. So, I mean, we can come in and we can actually cut pro what's nice about these drone softwares is they're building a lot of really great viewers in to kind of view and analyze the data. So we can cut sections of the site, look at heights, profiles of things. Um, and then for me, we're also use this when we're looking at establishing our tower crane, I can come in and I can actually just dimension heights of the buildings around by it. So we can verify, you know, how tall things are. So we're going to clear it, make sure we're staying you know, a certain distance away. Um, we've also used it for measuring like power lines. So I can actually pull a dimension because you're not going to go out there with a tape measure and pull it up to the overhead wire. But in the drone scan, I mean, as long as we're within, you know, a few inches, I'm not too concerned about the tolerance. So using that to analyze, you know, like the overhead wires, that's a big thing that we're doing. And then this is the last one and I'll turn it back to you. One of the fun things we did is I could take this 3D data, bring it into our modeling space and we we're looking at where to place one of our webcams. So I went, we've, got all the model data for what the camera lens was like. So I could throw it in the model and we could make sure that, hey, if we put the camera here, we can capture the entire building in one shot, or if we would have to, you know, adjust it through construction. And that's really being able to analyze the, the existing <laughs> conditions. Definitely a fun one right there. That's, that's for sure. And, and it's going to eliminate you having to make a, a camera adjustment a couple weeks or months down the road, right? Yep. And then let's see here. The one that always gets a little bit of traction with people. If I can find it. Boom. Is during construction, we're doing it a lot for like our concrete pours. So it's always, um, it becomes a big thing with all this reinforcing. And now we're, we have these like post tension cabling that runs through there, really being able to coordinate everything that goes in there being able to just get an overhead shot, you don't realize how hard it is to see where things are when you're standing on the deck or on the ground, where when you get up and actually get like an overall view of the job site, it kind of becomes like a lot clearer where things are. So we, we kind of have a whole process where I'm really just using that 2D image. I'm not even dealing with 3D geometry. 
just that yeah. stitched ortho mosaic and we're overlaying drawings on that. So we're back checking our work. So that's kind of like during construction, um, kind of some workflows I've built in. Yeah, that's phenomenal because that's a lot of space and you couldn't capture that with ground maybe imagery. And then once you pour concrete over it, you know, you got to go back in there. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's archived data. Um, thanks for that, Kyle. With uh, Ghoul Res, I want to bring up here this map um, yep. that has uh, finished processing from our flight in the beginning um, of the conversation. So you can see here. And I want. Could you could you go back to the main screen, Paul? Yes. Just one second. Let's let's show something. So you've got the map here, but if you go in uh, details, click details, because we're talking about primarily analysis of the of what you've captured. So here you can see where the map was flown flight path you can get the flight details on the left side in the menu in the menu and you can share etc you know you've got some options to, to play around and that is what basically public safety guys would be doing uh yeah we can go into view from there and this is um this is the model that you flew asked, the in model the that we of the in the beginning so not right. even uh, an hour ago and yeah. having this up, we can also show on, on other, you know, the softwares, once you get to this point, it's just a matter of how you get to this point. We're looking at similar things and we're going to be able to pull similar data. So we've talked about measurements and, and one thing we've talked about is accuracy. So I'm just going to real quick get this uh, line out here. And then, so 36.42 feet, right? And I had walked this out, measured this earlier. 36 feet is the measurement. Um, with measuring off of, and Gores, you can talk to this, measuring off of this 3D point cloud, right? There's room for tolerance. And I didn't zoom in and, and quick hit the points, but you can see how this information um, comes up fast and quick and, and is relevant. So Gores, is there, other than this model, um, is there something that you want to speak yeah. to from public safety? Like what is public safety using um, mapping modeling for? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll screen, share my screen in just a second. Yeah, I'll stop this here. If there's any questions, I know we haven't really had many uh, questions. I think one popped up that Kyle had answered regarding and ground photos. But if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to drop that in the Q&A. Right, so this is a, a chat. This is from the latest protests uh, in the area. And uh, we're just gonna view this model here. Um, so here you can see the flight path. It's a bit different from the regular model. And uh, let's go in here. And now the purpose here for this flight, like, like you had mentioned, uh, to me earlier was having uh giving public safety uh a current map and model of a zone in california that is kind of like occupied or uh protesters are kind of keeping folks out of uh, i'm not 100 percent familiar with it yeah yeah so here you can see uh, we've got some annotations you can measure the whole area and you can, you know, look at all the. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, yeah, okay, perfect. And then uh, how you can play with the data is basically you map out distance. distance. And, for, and for public safety, I would say is just being able to see things, right? It's not always taking measurements. When we talk accident reconstruction, it is about getting yeah. certain things, but. For public safety, you know, schools, active shooters, uh, there's all kinds of scenarios where quick uh, mapping, uh, like we're seeing here, um, and, and what you're doing with public safety is, uh, is important. 
Yep, yep, yep. Data isn't always and, numbers. I'm, what I'm trying to get is that the data isn't always numbers um, or, or, a, or a end product that we see. Sometimes it's just being able to observe. Right, right. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll quickly switch over to a different model as well. Yeah. I want to show. Yeah. So while he's bringing that up, I mean, I yeah. can add, it's going to be similar like safety in our sites when we're getting the overall view is we're always looking at, you know, egress points, like in the, in the emergency situation where are egress points, where we're, you know, access for deliveries. So all that kind of logistical, you know, information that you'd be concerned about, uh, just getting an, an overhead view really just allows you to see all that. And then one other thing we haven't touched on in here, but we've done like 360 photos. Sometimes they just prefer those even more than a map, but and like you're saying, sometimes photos is all you need. And we're seeing that with the Skydio X2 that was just released where they have this now, the 360 super zoom video uh, where they're stitching all those cameras together. Excuse me, much yeah. like I've seen you do with the construction. Um, now here, I think Gulrez is trying to bring up just to demonstrate again how public safety are able to. Um... Yeah. So here, now that we see the model, let's let's go to a point within the model around, let's say, this area, and we'll click this button. So here we can basically get a street view of the area, right from from Google Maps, and this you can use this to compare. Basically, in uh, you know the current situation versus what was going on a few days ago, and so you can get different points from the the 3D viewer. Yeah, um, and then you go back to the model. And we did see this yesterday with uh, during our electrical uh, drones and power distribution transmission. We saw where they. We were able to 3D model a uh, stack, and they were able to inspect it by clicking on the model, and then those images, yeah. right, would come up and allow that further inspection. I think Kyle exactly. mentioned that. Exactly, and then you can see whatever has been done. And capture and screenshot. And capture, exactly. Uh, another, mm -hmm. another thing is, um, it's, it's you. If you want, this. I think you're gonna bring up the night model. Yep. So the night model, and this is one thing that we're seeing with uh, that video, videogrammetry uh, versus, and I don't mean we're coming to the end of the session to just dump more uh, on folks, but photogrammetry and videogrammetry, right? Because video is, is capturing just a series of photos and then taking those images and doing the same uh, stitching uh, process. And what we see is that ability to map at night. So... Uh, this model here that Gores is bringing up is a public safety agency that's really pushing the boundaries in regards to UAS and um, flying at night with, with it limited light and creating uh, usable apps and models because in maybe in construction and some environmental sciences and surveying, we have the um, ability to go out during the day um, in public safety, you don't know when uh, an accident's going to occur. You, you don't know when something will happen. And, and it, you know, hey, we all know we, maybe growing up, bad things happen past uh, midnight or whatnot. So you've got to be prepared. We've got to have tools that can operate in, in all environments. So with five right. minutes and gores, you can just talk to this uh, quickly. Right. So this is a typical, let's say, car accident. You'd come in here and you can get the GPS points. Uh, you can annotate, uh, let's say, point of contact. And you can put that here. And you can get some measurements. And this, is, this was done from uh, using five uh, Fox Fury lights. This was done in West Windsor. Uh, yeah together with Fox Fury. So if you've got normal, good, if you've got good street lights, it's still gonna work, but you know. Um, and then there's one thing you could, for example, you could clip something and get it, 
get it outside the model and then you can view it. Yeah, and these things are important. Like that, right? Um, this is what law enforcement is doing, right? When their yeah. public safety is crush factor. So there is for, for that accident, right. value, you can pull usable data. Right. And you could get screenshots of the current view. You could get a top screenshot from there. And then essentially at the end, at the end of the day, what will happen is you'll, you'll probably write a night accident at XXX and, you know, write a case number, something, and you'll, you'll get a report. And that is, uh, so essentially what happens after, you know, flying the mission. This, this, the whole process of planning, the execution, and then the analysis towards getting a report for your evidence, this is gonna be maybe, if you exclude the time of processing the model, which happens on the cloud, it's maybe 10 minutes tops, tops. And you get a PDF report from there. And this is exciting just with the, the dark and the ability with the video versus photo. There's just the, the industry is so quickly. So for educators, really, there's, um, there's information out there um, to connect you. And I think that the equipment, which we didn't really touch on, but I, I do in closing, um, would like uh, each of our panelists to, to uh, touch on, just mention the equipment that they're flying because uh, we, we did a intro to the current drone platforms and talked about the Mavic, the Phantom, even the EB, um, the fixed wing, uh, which in Artis, I believe you're operating. So, because we want the folks to know that they can do this with students in the classroom. They don't have to have $50,000 drones. Um, yep. So, right. So for, <laughs> for this model, you can see here, uh, if you just go in the flight, basically you need all of this data as well to have a, a strong, uh, you know, support for your evidence as a from piece 210 and the camera type and you've got all those things here which you can just pick off the flight so this one this one was flown using a matrice 210 right on all right go um, ahead narissa uh, yeah and narcisa i was going to say if you can uh yeah. if you can uh give us kind of a closing statement wow it's I, I don't mean to make this seem weird to just be like hey mention the drones that you fly and then close out um but if that's all right, if you don't mind doing yeah, that. Yeah, sure, yes. So I would just like to add that I have been teaching a drone class at UNCW for three years now. I actually have a, a, in the curriculum. So I am happy to, um, if any of the educators would like to get in touch with me, I would actually be happy to share my syllabus. And I do all the training. I do hands-on training with my students using the, uh, DJI Mavic drones. They are cheap and they're easy to, to maneuver. And now, I mean, they're absolutely fantastic for teaching purposes. And like I said, yeah. I have a lot of modules that I would be happy to share. And in closing, I think I would be extremely excited to maybe even help out or do virtual um, tap, tap into the classroom. And that is part of my job is to educate and especially to outreach to high schools. It would be, uh, I would be delighted to do it myself or help the educators in the classroom. And I think getting students interested and seeing the possibilities of all the things they can do with drones. Like you had great examples, like what we do with drones. I mean, I have a over $300,000 project with the Department of Transportation now using just drones and trying to help them get drones into their workflows, essentially into their planning workflows. And that's huge. So getting students exposed to all the various um, potential career avenues and employment opportunities just using drones. I think it's fantastic. I would be happy to <laughs> in the future. That's Excellent. All. I'm going to ask you to put to drop your email, if you don't mind, right okay. into the chat so people know. I think you may have already, but if you can drop it in there again. And uh, for folks, the, those educators, definitely reach out. I said it yesterday. Get, yeah. on, get on LinkedIn, too, and, and I think we're all on LinkedIn. Um, Absolutely. But, but awesome. Thank you, Nar Narcisa, for joining. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, Gores, you want to go ahead and just kind of tell us Well, you mentioned the M210 and then a couple other platforms, you know, that public safety leverage to collect these models and uh, just give, a, give us your thoughts. Right. So uh, most of the departments have been using DJI. Um, the most suitable one are for, for mapping purposes is Mavic. You don't need a very expensive drone. Uh, Mavic works just fine. Um, we are now seeing a lot of interest in Autel as well. And uh, 
I mean, the Matrice and, and, and M300, those kind of drones are maybe a bit more uh, high end and uh, serve other purposes for, for law enforcement as well. Um, but yeah, so, so far, mostly it's been DJI and uh, Mavics for, for, for scene mapping for active crime or for, you know, crime, you know accidents, yeah. that kind of stuff. And now we're looking at Autel as well. Right on. And then anything you want to kind of close out in regards to like from education standpoint, you know, how educators are just. I think, I think it's, it's very important to understand that when you look at 3D modeling, 3D modeling is, is even though it's one type of, you know, technology or, or end product, a 3D model looking at it as an end product, it's, it's, it's one thing, but it's very different for each other industry. And the requirements of uh, each sort of person is very different. And only if we're able to address that, um, both from a learning point of view and from an a industry point of view where we're providing those services, only then we can enable 3D modeling for all. So as I said, the main problem with public safety has been that they haven't been able to get enough training. They don't know how to do all you know, a lot of complicated stuff. To be honest, even myself, I'm not an expert on drones, but I've learned fairly quickly because I'm working on a solution with public safety that is now catered to just them. So what, what we should think about is l looking towards things that are suitable for each vertical and, and trying to address those verticals separately versus creating like a one for all approach. Right, and, and all these around, you got fire uh, courses in the high schools, right? They're teaching fire, and the drone is a tool. So it's, it's if we can get the students at the younger age engaged, hands-on with drones, that I know is what's going to help really, like, take this industry forward, the, the, the younger folks coming in, um, much like we see, is, is saying, hey, I understand this, and, and this is a benefit. Um, so thanks for that, Gulrez. Kyle? gonna hand it off mm -hmm. to you and just let us know what is it you're flying right and then uh how is that the we work building behind you uh yeah but whatever side i'm on yeah that one the lower okay that's it all right sorry about that anyway go, go ahead you're fine uh so i mean i've been flying the dji phantom 4 pro since i started but we have some other people who have been flying the mavic pros like they mentioned i mean they're essentially you know, just over a thousand dollars and you can do anything you need with them. So, I mean, it's a great, you know, entry into the, that market. Um, and I would just say like going forward, you know, we're starting to implement it on more and more jobs. It's starting to just be a standard. Um, we do have some people that are dedicated drone pilots and, you know, collaborating with some people like yourself who are really focused on drones themselves, but we're also starting to certify you know, assistant project managers or people who have other roles. So to me, it's like coming up, if you have the skill of flying a drone, I mean, it's only going to benefit you in whatever career you go into. It's just another skill set you have. Um, Cause I'm finding a lot of people, it's, they're not dedicating a hundred percent to doing drone work. They're doing a number of things. And this is just, you know, another skill set you have being flexible. Yeah, that's a good point. Because with uh, growing up and even in the military, it's like when you get sit down, if there's an open position available and you're sitting you know, next to the um, guy or girl that it's you and him or her that's going to get the job and the person saying, well, you both have this, you both have this, mm -hmm. you both have this. Oh, but you have a part 107 certificate but, and you've flown, you've got 20 hours of drone experience. Oh, you've never flown drones before. You know, that right there is kind of that, that potential leg up for that project manager position or um, you know, what have you, what you mentioned. So that's, that's a great point to make. Um, looks like questions answered. Gores is jumping on that. Gores, at this time, too, Kyle, if you don't mind dropping your information in there, uh, maybe an email. And Gores, if you drop your email in the chat so that folks can reach out and connect and, and ask questions. It looks like Scott uh, Gulrez is asking some pretty uh, uh, good questions regarding to the, the night mapping. Yes, and I'm trying to answer. Yeah, and I'm gonna, 
Yeah, and I'm yeah. gonna wrap up here, so I don't All want right. him to get missed. And Scott, uh, just give it. Scott, just try sky brows for what you're saying. <laughs> just, just give that a try. And then, and then, Narcisa Lashonda. Um, I don't know if you've seen. She asked a question. She's at. We connected. Yes. Awesome. We connected LinkedIn already. We're we're on. Great. Awesome. I'm, I, this is what this is all about. Um, yes. Thank you to all the panel. Thank you to all the panelists at this time. Um, what I want to do is you guys can, can go. I'm going to kind of let you guys leave because I know you probably have stuff to do. And uh, I want to stay on here with any of the instructors with uh, DPI that just might have any questions um, that they want to ask and just do a closeout statement with them. So Thank you all of you for joining and I really look forward to talking more and I do think that there's going to be opportunities to bring, you know, more educational information, um, at least to the state, because they're really trying to push and, and help get kids that information. So thank you all of you. Thank you. Oh yeah. Thanks for the invite. Bye. Good to meet y'all. Thank you guys. Likewise. Thank you. All right. Well, that was a really uh, great session. Um, I did see some uh, folks may have dropped off, but at this time, if um, anyone that had tuned in has any questions and not even, um, not even specific to what we just talked about, but anyone that's been tuned in for the last three days that has seen the, the current drones um, webinar, the uh, drones in transmission and distribution or this drone mapping um, if there's kind of any questions um, not really seeing any uh, nothing popping in uh, you're welcome Paul uh, Matt and if you guys have any questions about hardware or software 910 drones um, we've developed a uh, industry partnership with NC DPI we do training, sales, repair, and services out of Fayetteville, North Carolina. We're working with uh, four different schools right here in the state. Um, so again, any questions you have, if you have um, drones as part of your program that you aren't sure what you can or can't do with them, if you wanna figure out what, uh, maybe what direction you should take things in, definitely reach out and, and we can set up uh, a time to chat and just talk further um, because that's what 910 Drones is all about. We're helping individuals, businesses, and organizations uh, leverage the hardware and software uh, associated with UAS. So again, thank you everybody. Thank you to Dr. Barber. Um, thank you to Wayne Bailey um, and, and all the, the folks that have helped kind of put this event together to bring you guys this information. Um, so everybody have a, a great uh, rest of your afternoon and enjoy your weekend.